The postscript to Umberto Echo's The Name of the Rose opens with a poem by Soruana Inez de la Cruz, a fabulous woman known in some circles as the worst nun in history. That title owing in part to when she signed a letter in her own blood with the phrase, I, the worst of all. What made her the worst was a thirst for knowledge and an unconquerable intellect that refused to be silenced by the men of her era. Living in colonial Mexico of the 1600s, she joined a convent to escape from things like sexist restrictions and suitors who had no interest in her intellectual aspects. In the nunnery, however, Sor Juana gained access to all manner of books otherwise denied to women at the time, as well as the freedom to pursue her interests. Within the walls of the Hieronymite convent of Santa Paula, Sor Juana wrote numerous plays, poems, translations, critiques, and music. Her works occasionally got her into hot water with religious as well as political officials, especially when she criticized the hierarchy of the Catholic Church or advocated for women's rights, such as access to higher education. She was known to use the quote, one can philosophize while cooking supper, and contributed to Quarles de Femme, a literary debate between women that took place over the course of 300 years, various women over time commenting on the capabilities of women and their place in society. So, we have a poem by a controversial early feminist nun, sometimes decried as a heretic, who prized access to a well-stocked library, yet academics seem determined to focus on how this poem, rather than the person who wrote it, relates to the novel The Name of the Rose. Specifically, they hope to unlock some meaning in the title. It's shocking since the poet is, perhaps, more important than the lines of the poem, such as the labyrinth of interpretation. Granted, this piece contains the lines... Red rose growing in the meadow, you vaunt yourself bravely, bathed in crimson and carmine, a rich and fragrant show, but no, being fair, you will be unhappy soon. It sounds even better in the original Spanish, but my poor pronunciation would do it a disservice. Suffice it to say, while it's obvious why folks would think some meaning might be gleaned from the poem, anyone exploring the secrets of the title are wasting their time. In the very postscript the poem opens, Author Umberto Eco remarks on a desire to avoid any specific meaning in the title. This is because he didn't want the reader locked into a mindset from the get-go. Eco writes how an early working title for his novel was The Abbey of the Crime. He changed it because of his concern readers would then focus too much on the mystery in the novel. So he sought to create a title that would be at best neutral or utilize a word so symbolically stuffed it could be saying almost anything. As Echo wrote, I liked it because the rose is a symbolic figure so rich in meanings that by now it hardly has any meaning left. The name of the rose is, at the surface, a murder mystery. It takes place in 1327. A monk named William of Baskerville is traveling with a novice, Adso of Melk, to a Benedictine monastery in Italy. The monastery is renowned for its fabulous library containing all manner of books. In essence, it's a center of knowledge. Although going there to attend a theological debate, William and Adso are almost immediately asked by the abbot to investigate the recent death of a monk. Although William quickly solves that riddle, other gruesome deaths soon occur, which deepen the first mystery. It's almost as if a serial killer is stalking the monastery, and it's up to William and Adso to discover what's going on. Throughout their investigation, various topics are explored, none more so than heresy. A work of historical fiction... The Name of the Rose takes place in the shadow of the Inquisition, which became a bloody instrument of suppression because of the rise of popular heretical mass movements. The Catholic Church, unable to peacefully put down groups such as the Cathars, began utilizing torture and other brutal, bloody methods to crush any opinions it found antithetical. Namely, divergent religious orders, groups, and individuals questioning the Church's authority as well as its vast, vast wealth. This works in the novel because not only is a theological debate soon to take place at the murder-filled monastery, but it lends depth and suspicion to several characters. William is able to deduce some of the monks used to be members of popular heretical movements, some violent, some simply despised by the church. Their pasts then muddy the waters, making them suspects in the case. Are they hiding more than their nefarious associations? Was someone killed to keep their secrets? Other topics include homosexual encounters between monks, the less-than-religious reasons some took monastic positions, such as money and power, 
love versus lust, the treatment of women, the nature of sin, and the overall quest for knowledge, that latter being the most significant. It seems the library is not just a repository of wisdom, it's also a container for those works considered hazardous. Not every book is available to anyone who asks. The abbot, and especially the head librarian, determine who may have access to which books. Texts from Muslim writers, for instance, are not given freely, though William is already aware they may contain very useful information. Essentially, the library acts as a symbol regarding who is allowed access to what knowledge. It also gives the opportunity for discussion of what makes information dangerous. Is an idea toxic? Can a book corrupt a person? Interestingly, these aren't just preachy moments. They bear fruit in the overall mystery. The opinions of certain individuals influence events within the monastery, which in turn result in murder, red herrings, and a sinister atmosphere pervading the abbey. For instance, there's a black market of sexual favors among monks to gain access to forbidden texts. An elderly monk possesses a raging hatred for laughter, and carvings in the monastery's church stir delirious, unsettling hallucinations. There's even an instance of certain herbs being secretly burned in order to induce phantasmagoric delusions as a security precaution. In other words, trippy fumes are utilized to secretly twist folks into thinking they see demons and ghosts in parts of the monastery. There's a lot that goes on in this book, but nothing more so than the demonstration that knowledge is imperfect. At best, the truth is a perspective constantly evolving. Some foster this evolution peacefully, Others water it in blood. Some have no problem quietly coexisting with different ideas or perspectives. Others aggressively crush differences out of existence. However, whatever one's position, there is no certainty. We all act according to what feels true. A fear persists that evil incarnate is prowling the halls of the monastery. The deaths which occur inspire superstitious dread, as well as pointing towards the wrong motivations. In fact, Secular and supernatural explanations for events run strangely similar routes. Some monks believe the murders are a sign of the Antichrist, as foretold in the Book of Revelations. Though William dismisses such notions, he doesn't disregard that whoever is responsible may be using that symbolism to obfuscate the matter, or even be motivated by it. Essentially, this composes two views to one truth, the same set of facts, the murders, lead to two seemingly valid conclusions. I don't want to entirely give away the ending, but suffice it to say, although William discovers the guilty party, his conclusions as to why events unfolded are entirely wrong. Our detective, then, has revealed the culprit, but not the reason for the crime. His somewhat boastful denouement becomes an inadvertent confession of ignorance. Furthermore, the reader isn't perhaps even privy to the actual story. The name of the rose opens with an unnamed narrator one is free to assume is Umberto Eco. However, what's more important is that this beginning details how the narrator came across a book that, quote, claimed to reproduce faithfully a 14th century manuscript, end quote. The narrator looks for proof events described therein are accurate, but can only find tantalizing tidbits suggesting some authenticity. Eventually, he decides the story may be credible, yet is troubled by certain other concerns. He writes, On sober reflection, I find few reasons for publishing my Italian version of an obscure neo-Gothic French version of a 17th century Latin edition of a work written in Latin by a German monk. Although obviously the narrator found reason enough to put said book out in the world, this opening is a reminder that even if regarded as true, the story we're about to read is fraught with an accuracy issue. The first person tale is itself set down decades after events have taken place. So we the reader are essentially exploring a memoir of old events translated across several languages, interpreted by at least two different authors from wildly different time periods. We can't really be sure how accurate anything is. The reader just has to take it on faith this is the truth, although that said, it's not, it's fiction. In an interview for Louisiana Channel, Umberto Eco remarked how his own private collection of rare books primarily featured texts proven to be wrong. 
He preferred Ptolemy's inaccurate cosmology to Galileo's accurate one. During the same interview, he put forward the notion that falseness is more easily proven than the truth is. The book, The Name of the Rose, is, in many ways, an exploration of this philosophy. Not only are historical events referenced wherein Europe tore itself apart over theological ideas no one can ever really prove, they can only have faith what they believe is true, but it also contends with why people seek knowledge. After all, there are things which can never really be known, such as the mind of another person, the mysteries of the heart, and the purpose of existence. Plus, what is regarded as true changes as facts become more apparent. Consider, the main story is told by an elderly Adso reflecting on his youth. The decades in between have surely altered his perspective. Remarks he makes himself imply the story would be very different if written in his youth. Keep in mind this quote. After so many years, even the fire of passion dies, and with it what was believed the light of the truth. Who of us is able to say now whether Hector or Achilles was right, Agamemnon or Priam, when they fought over the beauty of a woman who is now dust and ashes? That's why this book contains so much. This is a gruesome murder mystery set in a mountaintop abbey. It's gothic in ways that might make Robert Smith say, calm down. It's a tale of forbidden love, knowledge, and religious heretics. There's a noir element to it, as well as a classic Sherlock Holmes feel. There's history aplenty, but whenever that gets stale, sinister fiction kicks in to enthrall the audience once more. Though that said, calling the history stale does it a disservice, since it all fuels the overall narrative. Essentially, there's so much to unpack and enjoy, it's a shame to lose any of it. Subsequent readings can only lead to new depths, yet there is always the question of what, if anything, is true. Furthermore, does it even matter? In that same Louisiana Channel interview, Umberto Eco shares an anecdote about a famous poet who, despite referencing certain types of flowers, never actually saw them or experienced them in any capacity. The poet's only reason for planting them in poems is that they sounded right, lyrical, or whatever. The extra meaning came later. Such is the broader truth revealed by the name of the rose. We react to knowledge when we find it, and that reaction can be more revealing than whatever facts have been uncovered. In many ways, how we engage with the world, our principles and choices, requires a sense of certainty reality doesn't actually provide. Books offer ideas, but no definite answers. Even science eventually reaches a limit, since some things defy objective, quantifiable analysis. What's left in the end is personal experience and faith that we've divined a guiding truth. This is all masterfully explored in The Name of the Rose. As Umberto Eco wrote, a novel is a machine for generating interpretations. From its title to its contents, this book certainly generates an abundance. Yet it isn't a grim day at the factory turning pages, cranking out reactions. It's postmodern without being pretentious. Metafiction that isn't so overtly self-conscious, the story gets lost in the funhouse. More wonderfully, although fertile ground for academic analysis debating the use of certain names, images, and stylistic choices, The Name of the Rose is an enjoyable story any reader can delve into. It may be one of the most accessible postmodern novels of the 20th century, especially considering how postmodernism often seems to pride itself on inaccessibility. I direct you to James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake and almost anything by David Foster Wallace. Still, there are layers for those who want to find them, but exploring the depths isn't necessary to appreciate Echo's story. At one point, William of Baskerville remarks, Books are not meant to be believed. When we consider a book, we mustn't ask ourselves what it says, but what it means. That said, the book, The Name of the Rose, makes it clear that meaning is often a matter of perspective. This calls to mind the words of Sorwana, who wrote, I believed when I entered this convent, I was escaping from myself, but alas, poor me, I brought myself with me. If there is any concrete meaning to this novel or its title, every reader finds that for themselves. What we find says more about us than about the book. The same could be said of events at the monastery in The Name of the Rose. The overarching mystery and how everyone reacts to it reveals their character in ways many of them would rather not show. 
I have a final quote from Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. In a way, I think it sums up why people should read not just a book like this, but books in general. She said, I don't study to know more, but to ignore less. After all, the name of the rose is something beautiful to behold, yet it can be covered in thorns. There's a danger as well as a beauty to this book, but its intention isn't to inform you so much as it is to make you more aware.